Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on practical radio operating tips. I am Robbie Goswami, React 104, also 9 Zulu 4 Romeo Golf. Our agenda for this evening's webinar will involve some theoretical concepts, but some tips on radio operations. It's targeted at persons who operate two-way radio systems. So what is the purpose of this webinar really? Why are we discussing this topic? Why is it of interest? Why is it important to us? So the aim is for us to have a cadre of trained radio operators and it starts with us sharing best practices from our experience. So what I'm about to present is by no means the only uh, game in town, the only story, but it's one perspective that hopefully we can use to build upon. But really we are aiming for efficient and effective operations, especially in emergencies. We are looking to standardize our radio operations and we also wish to encourage professionalism. So while a lot of two-way radio operations, react operations, amateur radio operations, emergency communications are voluntary, we do strive for high degree of professionalism. We also need to be trustworthy and that is from the perspective of our served agencies, the organizations to which we work for, with, and collaborate with. We need to be dependable and reliable. And in order to do so, we need to have some training and some standardization. We always striving for excellence. This allows us to be in a state of readiness for emergencies, those that we really, really hope never occur. Uh, but we hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And this webinar is really aimed at React operators, especially new recruits, but it can really apply generally to any two-way radio operators. So just adjust accordingly to your circumstance. So any communications type webinar course, um, in terms of practical tips, I usually like to start with a theoretical construct and that is what is up on your screen the communications model and this is just something for us to bear in mind when we are communicating we don't have to study this we don't have to memorize it but it helps us as a reference point where we have a sender it could be a radio operator using a handheld radio or what we call a walkie-talkie and we have a receiver on the other end and of course there are some things in between we have the message that we send across but it has to be encoded and decoded and there's a channel of communication and in our case it'll be radio and of course inside of that communications channel we can have noise the things that prevents us from communicating and we need to be mindful of those things so you'll hear us talking about, about noise during the presentation and of course we have this concept of feedback, how does someone know that uh, we have transmitted and received the message accurately without any problems, so we need to have feedback. So this is just a model that you may wish to refer to from time to time and uh, just help us in conceptualizing what we are about. So we want to start a bit in terms of our radio equipment. So unfortunately, this session is not in person where we are able to demonstrate equipment. So even though we call it practical tips, it's a sort of pseudo virtual session. So we'll have to take it for granted that we have equipment in front of us. So we have a couple of pictures that will hopefully make this thing real, even though we're doing virtual. So when we refer to radio equipment, towards the right hand side of the slide we have a handheld radio or transceiver or walkie-talkie as we may wish to call it and we at the bottom we have another type of transceiver or radio that could be installed in a base or a mobile station base will be when you install it at home uh, powered accordingly using an external antenna uh, mobile when you have it inside of a vehicle and of course, it has to be powered somehow depending on whether it's in a vehicle or in a mobile. But we do have some buttons or knobs or controls on our equipment. Uh, what is typical would be a power button to switch it on or off. It could be a push button. It could be a button that we turn. It could be a knob that we turn. We have a volume control to increase or decrease the level of audio 
We don't want it to be too loud and we don't want it to be too soft. We have a channel selector. As radio operators, we may have a selection from multiple channels. As amateur radio operators, we may have channels as, as well, but we may also have what is known as VFO, where we can change the frequency at will. We can be frequency agile. Uh, we, we have a function called squelch that ceases the noise. Uh, when you're listening to your radio, you don't want to hear a hash continuously, let's say like AM, FM radio, if you think about it, when you're on an FM dial, if you tune to a frequency, there's no noise, you'll hear a lot of hash. So the squelch will control that noise so you don't listen to hissing, hashing sound all the time. Uh, you will have a microphone that you transmit with and um, you press the push to talk and you speak into it. And there's some sort of antenna because we're talking about radio. There's some element that needs to radiate that radio frequency signal from the radio. Uh, so that's the antenna of some sort. There's some sort of power supply. Uh, this is electronic equipment and we need to have power for it. And that could be either a battery or it could be a cable coming from a power supply. And it could be in the case of a base station, it could be a battery with a charger. And we may also have a scan button. If we have more than one channel and we are listening to one channel, we may want to find out what's happening with the other channels. And therefore, uh, while we are on one channel, our radio could be scanning very quickly, doing a round robin through the other channels, listening for it for you know, a millisecond or two, see if there's any traffic, go to the next channel and so on, and come right back to the channel that you are on selected. So that scan feature, and we have to be very careful with scan, very lovely feature, but we need to be mindful of it. Why? Because when a uh, scan stops on a channel and it's listening to that channel, if there's traffic on our substantive channel that we are tuned to, we may not hear it because our radio has stopped on that channel. So we need to know how a scan is configured, if it's with priority, if it's return, if it's uh, going to stay on that other channel once there's traffic. So scan is a feature and a function on many radios. And of course, we may have an external microphone or a speaker. Uh, our bottom diagram shows there's a power supply plugged into a receptacle outlet from the electricity provider and we are supplying uh, voltage usually 13.8 volts to our transceiver radio and we have some sort of cabling or referred to as feed line that goes from our transceiver or radio to an antenna and this antenna could be an antenna on top of a vehicle it could also be a base station antenna in the case of our uh, base operations. All right, so we want to define a couple differences between handheld, mobile, and base stations. So that's for new radio operators, one of the mysteries. People ask, you know, what's the range of this radio? Or you get a radio in your hand and find that you are not being heard clearly, and you're wondering, is something wrong? So we need to talk a bit about the different type of radio equipment, and each has its pros and cons and its functions. So a handheld radio, what we will call a walkie-talkie that we hold in our hand. It's very portable, of course. It's very convenient, but it's limited because of a low output power. Sometimes most walkie-talkies will have maximum transmit output of four watts. That's relatively low. And also note that antenna on top of your walkie-talkie, sometimes we call it a rubber ducky antenna. That is a very inefficient antenna, very lossy and so on. So it's not an ideal situation. And that's why if you're wondering, oh, that's why sometimes um, people are telling me I'm not being heard clearly. It's because of all of these reasons. Yeah, so those are, so you have pros and cons with handheld. Very good for projects. You're going out, uh, let's say in a React project and you're doing a walkathon in an area, let's say around the Savannah, of course. One walkie-talkie will hear another. You're probably operating simplex uh, transmission, which we'll come to in a little bit, radio to radio. And that's fine, very portably, you want to walk around, maybe you're actually walking the savannah as well with the walker done. Very convenient, but if you try to reach a repeater, go on to a repeater channel to speak wide area at a long distance, you might find that that signal from your radio is not making it and cutting because of the terrain perhaps, maybe you are in a valley, maybe you are between buildings, and that low wattage output of four watts and the fact that it's a handheld radio with a very efficient, inefficient antenna could explain why it may not work in all scenarios. So persons who are wondering why a handheld radio doesn't have uh, countrywide or, or statewide or whatever area you're from coverage, it's because of the limitations. Excellent piece of equipment, but it does have some limitations. 
Now, mobile-based radios. So we sometimes use the term interchangeably, and that's just because sometimes the same piece of equipment that could be installed in your car, that's the radio, could also be installed on your base. So oftentimes the radio itself, the piece of equipment, might actually be the same uh, radio. Um, so the point, though, is that our mobile and base radio tends to have a higher transmit output power. Remember we said that the handheld radio may be limited to 4 watts, maybe 5 watts. There are some that run maybe 8 watts, but it's relatively low output power. And mobile base radios have tend to have a much higher output power. So there are mobile base radios with low output power, but typically you can get ones that go from 25 to 50 watts, even to 80 watts and so on. So you have a higher output power and that's why your signal can travel further uh, because of the higher transmit power. And you tend to also connect a mobile radio or base radio to an external antenna, an, an antenna that is on top of the roof of your car, for instance, instead of an antenna that's in your hand inside of a car. So an antenna that's outside of your car will cause your signal to reach much further just because it's outside, outside of the car. And of course, there are many factors that depend, that determines that range. Also on a base station, you will have an external antenna. It might be on the roof of your building or your home or your structure. And that antenna may also have some gain that will cause the signal to reach much further. So that's why a base or mobile radio tends to have a further range, as we may call it, uh, for that signal. And therefore, if you are at home and you're transmitting with a handheld radio, you might find someone telling you you're sounding scratchy into the repeater. They're not hearing you clearly, but if you go and use your base station with an external antenna, higher transmit power, they may tell you that you're sounding loud and clear and you may wonder why. Well, it's simply because higher power output, greater gain, uh, better line of sight signal between your radio base station antenna and the repeater that you're trying to reach. Also, for simplex operation, which we'll come to and explain a little bit, which is radio to radio, you can get further range. This concept of range, and I have it in quotes there, people always talk about range. What is the range of a radio? What is the range of, range of my handheld radio? What's the range of a mobile radio? What's the range of a base station? Well, the simple answer is that it depends. It depends really on many factors. It's difficult to give one answer to what's the range of any particular radio or configuration. It depends on many things. If you're talking out into space, well, you could probably give an answer of many, many kilometers. But once it's on the surface of the Earth, you have many factors to consider. The terrain of the area, is it mountainous? Is it hilly? Is it a valley? Is it flat? Uh, you know, are there trees? Uh, are there buildings between you and where your, your signal is trying to go? What's the terrain? What sort of antenna are you using? Is it a base station with high gain or is it a, a lower gain antenna are you using a handheld? The operating conditions, atmospheric conditions, what's your transmit power? Uh, what frequency band are you using? Are you using VHF? Are you using uh, UHF? Or in the case of amateurs, are you using HF? And all of those factors will determine this thing that we call range. That's why there's no one easy answer. You have rules of thumb. Uh, in the case of amateur radio operations on the HF band, it depends on the time of day, time of year, and the sunspot cycle. So many factors affect this thing we call range. And our equipment, we need to utilize the appropriate equipment for the purpose that we need it for. So we need to know our radio. We need to know what each knob, each port, each button or switch does. We simply need to learn our radio. So the first time we get our radio, we need to ask questions. We need to perhaps read the manual, although sometimes reading a manual could be generic. Um, not all radios are configured with the features that are listed in a manual, but it can help. And finding out uh, how the radio operates, what are the functions, maybe from the supplier or someone who has some experience uh, can guide you. Be mindful. Remember when we said that there's a button called scan on your radio? That is a very nice function that could let you monitor the various channels that you have uh, configured on your radio. But it can also be problematic if you're not aware of how it operates. You may miss a transmission. So that's an example of what we mean by knowing your radio. Um, if your radio has different power level adjustments, low power, medium power, high power, be mindful of what button changes the settings. Be mindful of what setting it currently is because you may be trying to speak to someone 
on the repeater and they're telling you you're sounding very scratchy, you know, uh, you're not loud and clear at all. And you may just be transmitting on low power on your radio, whether it's a handheld radio or base station or mobile, you're on low power. And you, you may say, oh dear, I am on low power. You may switch to medium power and all of a sudden the person tells you, yes, big difference in signal, you're sounding loud and clear. So you need to know your radio. Now again, all of these features that we're talking about, not every single radio has all of those functionalities. So there are some radios that may not be able to switch the power levels at all. Uh, some radios, it has the capability, but the provider did not program a button to allow you to switch power levels. So just bear that in mind. Not every feature is available and not every feature that's available is necessarily programmed for you to access. Of course, while we're talking power levels, take the opportunity to mention that when it comes to output power, you might want to utilize the lowest power setting that will get you heard clearly, uh, loud and clear. The reason, for example, if you're using a handheld radio and you're talking simplex, let's say, again, we refer to a React project around the Queen's Park Savannah, for instance, or Walkathon, or any other such project, you are probably talking short range, the person is very close to you. So why do you need to run high power if you can select low power, select it, and it will give you increased runtime and conserve your battery. So all of these are a couple points just to illustrate, know your radio, know the features, learn it as best as you can and use it, uh, become familiar because sometimes you put your radio down for a little while and you don't pick it up for two weeks and you have just completely forgotten unless every single button is labeled or you have a, a screen, a color screen with a label for every single function, you may not remember what button one does and button two and so on. So that's where using it becomes very important. Also, in terms of your radio, why do you need to know how it operates well? You may have a radio that if you're speaking a normal tone of voice, three to six inches, you may find that a person tells you you're sounding loud and clear. But if you uh, pull the radio away, let's say 12 inches from your mouth, you may find that the person tells you you're sounding very soft. So you need to know that about the radio. How sensitive is the microphone? Because a uh, supplier may configure the microphone gain to low or high, and you may not know. So that's why we check our radios. We practice using it so that we know uh, if we need to speak very close to the microphone, a little further, but we generally say, you know, three to six inches or four to six inches would be appropriate, your mouth in front of the microphone itself. But we also say avoid whispering and certainly avoid shouting. So for a handheld radio, remember we said use the lowest power rating. Well, you want to make sure you know how long a radio will last on a full charge. And you may also want to have spare fully charged batteries, and this applies especially for emergency communications. So a little bit more about our radio equipment. And this is sometimes a hotly debated topic. What type of radio equipment can I use for what purpose? So radio equipment will be type certified for a particular purpose. So on the right hand side, we have examples of two radio, handheld radios, walkie-talkies as we may call them. One of them is a commercial radio for use by persons uh, who may have a commercial license. And the other radio is an amateur transceiver on an amateur radio that would be used by someone who has an amateur radio license. Uh, two different types of equipment and two different type certifications. And we say that amateur radio equipment has the capability to be frequency agile. You can punch in a frequency within its range of capability and you can receive and transmit there. So that's amateur radio. Uh, and therefore amateur radio equipment should not be used on commercial, uh, for commercial purposes because uh, commercial purposes, those persons are not trained and if they were to punch in a frequency or tune the VFO as we call it, they may go to a frequency and cause harmful interference. So amateur radio equipment really is for licensed amateur radio operators. Commercial two-way radio equipment, for example, tends to be channelized, channel one, channel two, channel three. Um, that's how you can often tell a commercial piece of equipment. Uh, it's channelized, it's programmed by an authorized dealer. And for example, that user uh, will not be able to change the frequency of operation. The dealer has to do it or the authorized dealer. Uh, software often has to be used to, to uh, program the radio. So it's locked, you can't just punch a frequency in. So that's one of the differences 
uh, how you can tell between a commercial radio and an amateur. There are many others, um, but the type certification really will tell you what's the purpose of the radio. Um, usually commercial equipment could be repurposed for use by licensed amateur radio operators. That is uh, generally a, new, a universal concept, uh, not in all jurisdictions, of course. However, amateur radio equipment cannot typically be used in commercial. So that's a bit of information on your radio equipment. You may be in possession of a radio and you need to look at it and say, is this an amateur radio transceiver or is this a commercial radio? And you need to know the answer to that question, depending on if you are licensed amateur or not, or if you're just using a frequency based on a commercial or some other type of license. So again, speaking of equipment, knowing our equipment, there's something called the IP rating, which indicates whether or not, you know, we like to ask, is this radio waterproof? <laughs> That's the question. Can I run out in the rain and use my radio? I don't know why you may want to do that, but I guess you, you know, you're asking the question, is it safe to do so? Uh, well, generally, um, we'll present a slide later on about safety and radio usage, but if you want to know what your radio is capable of, you need to check the IP rating. So some radios may be splash proof, some may be water resistant, but we need to make sure and take care that we don't uh, expose our equipment to moisture unnecessarily. Um, mo uh, as we, sometimes we say electricity and water don't mix, right? So we don't want to get moisture inside of our radios. The IP rating can often be found for the equipment, but you may have to look at these specifications. When you look at the IP rating, you'll see a number after IP. So IP55, for instance, that simply means that it's protected from a limited amount of dust, and it's also protected from low pressure water jets. And IP67, which is a higher rating, for example, is protected from dust, all sorts of dust, including Saharan dust. And it's also protected from immersion uh, between 15 centimeters and one meter in depth. In other words, you could drop it in a pail of water. Not that you would want to, but just note that if your radio says IP67, as long as you have not tampered with it, uh, opened it up and so on, uh, it is protected. So there's a chart coming afterwards and persons will have access to the slides and the recording and you can also research it on the different IP ratings. Just a note though, if your radio is not IP rated or you don't know what it is and you want to protect it, so you can use a Ziploc bag and seal the radio inside and still use the radio, believe it or not. You can use your radio uh, through a thin plastic, uh, such as a Ziploc bag. Yes, you will hear the transmission. It will be attenuated somewhat, but you will hear the transmission. And once you speak into the microphone and sufficiently uh, loud, persons will hear you through that plastic bag. So a Ziploc bag as a tip, you can use if you need to protect your radio in inclement weather, or if you may have some uh, spraying of water or something else around, uh, just bear that in mind as a tip. This is the slide on the various types of IP ratings, how it's constructed. So we said there's the letter IP followed by two digits. The first digit is this first column. It tells you what a zero is, what a six is, and all digits in between. And the second digit, again, you have from zero to eight, and it tells you what zero to eight is and you can always research that for IP ratings. So when you see your specifications in the radio, it'll tell you what that IP rating means. So we now come to discuss the difference between simplex, as we have been mentioning earlier, and repeater operation. So simplex operation for the purpose of uh, our radio communication discussion really is uh, radio to radio and back type transmission. So I'm showing on the screen here one handheld radio, one walkie-talkie, and another one. So if I transmit and that signal goes directly to this radio, and the person receives the transmission, and then they may reply to me uh, on the same frequency and back, um, that is a form of simplex, or what we call simplex transmission, radio to radio. In other words, the transmission is not going to any repeater and then I'm hearing the transmission via any other third-party repeater. It's coming straight from the antenna of the sender to the receiver, direct radio to radio. And we refer to that 
as simplex. It's using one frequency for that operation. Repeater operation, on the other hand, and a repeater is a tower with an antenna and uh, using two frequencies uh, that allows us to extend the coverage of our radio. So whereas uh, radio to radio, I might, I might get a couple of kilometers at best uh, in our terrain. I may have the ability to talk around town, as you see, or in a, a little area, a little district, but I may not be able to go across uh, to another part of the country with my handheld radio to radio. Same thing with base station and mobile. You, although you will have extended coverage on a base station and a mobile radio, you still have limitations because it's radio to radio or station to station transmission. But with a repeater, that repeater is going on a high location, usually a tall building. It could be a hill. Uh, it's usually centrally located to where people we need to communicate. And your transmission will go to that repeater and that repeater will retransmit or rebroadcast that to a wider area. So you have wide area coverage and many more persons will be able to hear you than would be able to direct to radio to radio. So that repeater retransmits and you, got, you have a greater coverage. So that's why repeaters are often used to extend coverage. And in some cases, you have multiple repeaters that are connected to each other that gives you wider coverage. And of course, persons will transmit back to the repeater and you will hear them. And usually with repeaters, two frequencies are used uh, for repeater operations. So that's the difference between simplex and repeater. Now when we are using our handheld, we have some tips. Of course, you know, in the era of cell phones, everybody use their cell phone to their head, to their ear. Sometimes we have it on our desk in front of us at an angle. And we try to use our two-way handheld radio, our walkie-talkie, just like we will hold a cell phone. When we do that, that is problematic, all right? So um, the reality is you need to hold your handheld radio more or less vertically. And the reason is that on the right-hand side, we are showing what a repeater station might look like. This is the tall tower that's on the hill, and this is an antenna that's on that tower, notice the orientation of the antenna. Uh, it's vertical, and we refer to that as vert vertically polarized. It's not horizontal, it's vertically polarized. So therefore, when you hold your walkie-talkie, like this chap here is, it's slightly at an angle, but it's more or less vertical, but he could do a little better. You want, when you're using your handheld radio, you want that antenna to be as vertical as possible so that the polarization will match. If you only tilt that radio, uh, put it uh, horizontally, like if you're holding it like a cell phone uh, on speaker mic and so on, and apart from not being heard clearly, the transmission, your radio frequency transmission will be, most of it will be lost because you don't have the same polarization. You need to have it vertical to match the base station antenna or the repeater antenna. So that's the first point. Remember that the antenna, the repeater site is vertically polarized. So you want to hold the radio vertically about three to six inches or so away from uh, your mouth, right? Remember always that the microphone should be right in front of your mouth. Sometimes people have the radio by their chest and they're talking and they're wondering why someone is telling them they're sounding soft. We'll come to those points later on, but you want to have that microphone in front of you, not touching your face, but uh, sufficient distance away and we say three to six inches. Your practice on using your radio will tell you what that optimal is. So if you're sounding distorted, you need to move it a little, way a little bit. If you're sounding soft, you need to bring, uh, bring it a little closer to your mouth. Uh, the, the third bullet point, if the radio is held at an angle, the polarization will not match and much of the transmission will be lost or wasted. And you may suffer a weak signal as a result. So. How you know that? The person who is receiving you're talking with, they'll tell you it's sounding scratchy, uh, poor audio, or you may not be able to access the repeater at all. So bear that in mind. If you're having trouble accessing it, just simply holding the radio upright may result in a thousand percent increase in your signal. Okay. Uh, always bear in mind the location of the repeater that you're trying to access. So if I'm in Port of Spain in Trinidad, the capital city, and I'm trying to use, let's say, the council repeater that is located in the central part of the island. 
And this could apply no matter where you are in the world because we have attendees um, from you know, different parts. Just imagine where your repeater is. Where is that repeater that you're trying to? And that's why sometimes we try to tell persons, you know, this repeater is located in central, it's located, located in north, it's located in east. Because you want to try and orient your radio. If it's a handheld, uh, you want to orient that radio on yourself. Accordingly, if you are behind a building uh, and it's a steel structure, and between you and that repeater is that big building. Well, a simple relocation to the front of the building where there's a clear line of sight to you between you and the repeater may make all the difference. That building may block your signal, but you need to know where that repeater is located. So intelligence and information about where that repeater that you're trying to reach can help in your house. Uh, if I know the repeater is located south of me and I'm having trouble getting through, I'm in the fringe area, I'm in a weak signal area, just relocating to that part of the house that faces the south can make all the difference. Okay, so another tip, another factor that affects our transmission is noise. So there are different sources of noise. You want to try and move away from sources of noise. It's the same thing when you're using a cell phone too, especially in speakerphone. Sometimes we don't know. We hear the noise in our area, radio, a transmission, our TV, and it may be sounding very soft, but microphones can be very sensitive. I'll pick that up. And funny enough, it might actually pick that up better than it'll pick up your voice. And a person may be hearing all that background noise. So as a radio operator, as a trained radio operator, as someone who is a practitioner, you want to make sure that the person here is hearing you with very clear audio. So move away from the sources of noise if possible. Such, such sources will broadcast radio. A DJ might be playing uh, music, television, machinery. Someone is grinding something or maybe you have a blender and, or cake mixer. All of those things will be noisy. Um, avoid the microphone picking up the background noise and it may sound very loud and irritating on the receiver's radio. It also allows you as the operator to hear the transmissions a little better. And if it is emergency traffic that you're trying to pass as well, you don't want to have to be repeating and saying, say again, say again. You want your transmission to go through the first time. So try to move away from noise, avoid noise. Note that even if an area is noisy and you're transmitting, there's no need to shout into the microphone. The reason we shout is because we want to hear ourselves. But really and truly, we don't need to hear ourselves. As long as you know your voice is saying the words, the microphone ought to pick it up. Now, if the noise is so loud, it may very well overshadow your voice. But trust that the microphone, just a couple inches in front of you, will be hearing your voice. Don't shout, because when you shout, you will, what we call, overmodulate, and you may come across distorted um, just because you need to hear yourself when the area is noisy. So try not to shout. Um, always aim for loud and clear transmission. That's what we are alluding to. That should be our aim, each of one of us as radio operators, to sound loud and clear. So that's why we will seek feedback from persons that we're talking, talking to. How are we sounding? Are we scratchy? Are we soft? Now, sometimes you will ask a radio operator to give you feedback and they say, yeah, you're loud and clear, but you're not really loud and clear. You know, they are hearing what you're saying, but that is not necessarily loud and clear. They're making out, you know, you're intelligible. You can, they can hear what you're saying, but loud and clear really is loud and clear. So that's where we need to develop a reference point as to just being heard and being heard loud and clear. Of course, uh, in the React practice, we know this quite well. And um, of course, we are speaking to quite a lot of new persons, new recruits, new joints, and persons may not, especially within the last year and a half, we may not have had too many projects. But the use of headphones greatly helps in noisy areas. So you'll see reactors in Trinidad Tobago, um, you'll have reactors that are working on, let's say, the Carnival project, and you'll see the reactors have headphones, headsets, noise cancellation with boom microphones and so on. That helps tremendously as opposed to trying to listen to a speaker on the front of a radio and trying to speak into that microphone. You have a headset or headphones can greatly help. So that's another tip that you may want to invest in for the particular radio that you have. Uh, it also helps with a bit of um, you know, privacy where persons may not hear your transmission. So that's another consideration. Also, just so that in terms of a tip as we're talking about handheld radio usage, always verify the state of charge of battery. Uh, it's one thing to have a fully charged battery and the other thing to have a halfway charged battery go out on a project, go out on an emergency, be deployed. 
and your radio is beeping because it's low charge. So always verify the state of your radio. Uh, similar to earlier, we said verify your operational state by doing radio checks. You know, find out if you're being heard. Is your radio working? And if you use your radio regularly, you would be doing radio checks automatically. But if you have not, when you pick up your radio after a while, do a radio check. Seek feedback from someone to give you a signal report. So very important, uh, not much discussed about our radio equipment is the concept of duty cycle. So let's talk a bit about duty cycle. Our, as radio operators, we need to be mindful of what duty cycle is. And each type of equipment may have a different duty cycle. So picture, for instance, uh, forgetting radio for a moment. Um, let's say we have a power washer or maybe a blender or cake mixer uh, or a hair dryer. If we were to read the manual, and uh, I'll encourage persons on the webinar, you know, check out a manual for any type of equipment that you have like that, that has a motto, and read the instruction manual, and see if your manual tells you anything about the duty cycle. They may not call it duty cycle, but here's what you're looking for. You're looking for a statement that says, equipment usage, one minute on, five minutes off. You'll be surprised if you look at a hand mixer or a cake mixer or some equipment that you don't expect to see something like that. It'll tell you one minute on, three minutes off. One minute on, five minutes off. If you see something like that, that's the duty cycle. Uh, same thing on a hair, hair blower, hair dryer. Uh, you might buy a hair dryer, pay a good price, yes. And then you might want to blow dry your hair for five, ten minutes. And you do that twice a day and you do it for the entire week and next thing the motor burns out or your hair dryer stops working and you say, but wait a minute, this is a defective unit. Well, no, it was not manufactured for that duty cycle. So on the bottom right hand corner here, we have a little graph that shows you what a 50% duty cycle looks like. It's 50% on, 50% off, 50% on, 50% off. Half of the time on, half of the time off and so on. And then you have a 10% duty cycle, 10% of the time on, 90% of the time off. 10% on, and so on and so on. And you have different levels of duty cycle. The point is that not all equipment is meant to use at max extra board um, all the time. Just the same way with a car, I don't expect a uh, speedometer may have 220 kilometers per hour max, but I don't expect to drive that from the time I switch on until I switch off the vehicle. So the same thing we need to be mindful of with radio, handheld radios, for example. Uh, we may think that if you notice, a handheld radio tends not to have a big heat sink. So the intention there is not to transmit for two hours at a stretch. Uh, the battery may last, but your radio itself, you're putting that under stress. So we need to be mindful that much radio equipment is not meant or designed for 100% duty cycle. It may overheat and it may fail. Also, batteries have a duty cycle. So most radio is not designed for 100%. We said that. Some repeaters as well, you know, we're using a repeater and you would think a repeater is automatically 100% UT cycle. Not necessarily. There are some repeaters that are designed for 50% UT cycle. It needs a little rest. So bear that in mind. Yes, a repeater is saying, what? A repeater, not 100% UT cycle? That's right. Uh, some handheld radios, if they specify it, if you're lucky enough to see that in the manual or the specs of the radio, it'll tell you between 10 and 25% UT cycle. So it's not meant to be keyed down or transmitting for hours and hours continuously. And batteries also have a duty cycle. So handheld batteries, if you are lucky enough to see a spec, it might tell you 5590, what is that? It means you can transmit for 5% of the time, receive for 5% of the time, and stand by for 90% of the time. Yes, and that is what will maximize the life. Once you use another duty cycle, other than that, you might get shorter battery life. So we come to safety now. Safety is the number one priority. Please try to avoid touching any antenna. You can get an RF burn, especially if the power output is high. So safety, there is something called RF burns or radio frequency burns. Try not to touch the antenna on your handheld, your mobile, whip, or your base station while it's transmitting. Avoid short circuit in a battery. If you connect the positive and negative, you might cause a spark. And depending on where you are, there can be an explosion and so on. So try to ensure once you have 
battery terminals exposed that you don't short circuit, cover them or insulate them if you can see them. Uh, bear that in mind. Also, we spoke about this a little earlier. Try not to operate your radio equipment during a lightning storm. That could be quite hazardous to you. Also, and this is especially for the amateur radio operators amongst us, uh, when you're connecting multiple radios to antennas, uh, especially if you're using things like a switch box, try to make sure that your radio is connected to the right antenna one and try to make sure you don't inadvertently connect two radios directly to each other using the antenna port. And that will cause you to transmit full power from one radio into the next. Yes, it has happened to people. So don't be one to discover it. Make sure that whatever configuration you connect your patch cables and switch boxes to, to your antennas, that you don't inadvertently connect radio to radio. It's bad enough to connect the radio to the wrong antenna. You'll have a high CBR and so on. But you, for sure, you will probably damage uh, another radio if you connect radio to radio directly, inadvertently. Most importantly, keep your antennas away from power lines. If you're doing a base station installation, for instance, make sure it's far away from. Also, when you install it, factor in that if it were to fall, that it will not touch the power line in case it were to fall. So you need to have that error, uh, margin of error as well. So apart from installing it away from the power line, make sure that if it happens to fall down, it, doesn't, it will not touch a power line. Of course, we say to carefully adjust your volume levels to avoid discomfort and injury. Uh, it has happened, persons have put on a headphones, have it at maximum volume, and they get a jolt when someone transmits. The same thing too, some people try to put their radio microphone, sorry, their re speaker of a radio next to their ear. That could be very dangerous as well. So always make sure you know the level of the volume before you try putting a radio close to your ear. Uh, you should really not put it in front of your ear, put it next to your cheek, maybe on top, whatever, especially that speaker. But the headphones, I mean, that goes over your ears. Just be careful of the volume levels when you're using it. Safety, number one priority. So a couple procedures, general concepts. We advocate for the use of plain language. We have English in brackets there. Use plain language, avoid jargon, avoid slangs. One of the reasons is that, you know, we may use terms and so on while we talk to one another using our radio equipment. But in an emergency, we don't want to be using jargon or slang too much. Even though amongst ourselves, we may recognize the term, you may, you may be interfacing with another agency, some sort of interoperability, uh, maybe unified command or something like that, and you are uh, liaising with other agencies and they may not understand your jargon or your slang. So if, if for those reasons alone, we should avoid it. But remember, what we do in an emergency is what we practice every day. So if we practice jargon and slangs every day, when an emergency comes, we may not have the time to think and we go right ahead and use jargons and slang. So in our day-to-day -day operations, let's avoid it. Avoid codes, codes that others may not understand. Um, always be clear and precise in your communication. Try to be brief and short and concise as possible, even during normal uh, transmissions. Again, what we practice in normal times may very well be what occurs when we are faced with an emergency. Always confirm your communication via readback. So if someone tells you that an ambulance is required for two persons, uh, when you are coming back to them, don't just say, okay, I heard you say, okay, uh, confirming that you require an ambulance for two persons and the person will tell you, yes, read back is correct. So always that feedback loop in our communications model, always try to do that as well, general concepts. And we're saying here, try to avoid confrontation, all right, in our operations. We come to now use of pauses in transmission. So of course, we like to talk. Many of us love to talk and we go on and on and on, pretty much like what I've been doing so far for the last 45 minutes. But in our radio operations, we need to pause, we need to stop. When we're transmitting, it's important to leave pauses in those transmissions because if there's emergency traffic and we are talking for two and three minutes at a time, we may lose the opportunity for someone to come in with the emergency traffic and that could be a life at stake. Also, some repeaters, if we're using repeaters that we talked about earlier, have a timeout timer. Some of them are set to three minutes. 
So just bear in mind, you may shut down a repeater if you are transmitting too long. And of course, you know, try to make sure that you have short transmissions. As discussed before, we want to have brevity in our transmissions. So some radio etiquette. Always be respectful when we conduct ourselves. Always be authentic. We want to have good positive etiquette. Be courteous, be cordial, be kind, have patience. It's acceptable to have situation reports. It's okay to have networks. It's good to do radio checks. It's good to pass traffic information and hazards, safety, weather. Use the phonetic alphabet. All those are very positive things to do. There are some things we should avoid on the radio. And while we may be focusing a lot on react operations, it applies often to amateur radio and general operations. In other words, if you have to discuss these things, perhaps another medium is best. So we just say what they are, politics, uh, religion, contentious topics. Uh, we don't want to be using expletives or foul language, as we call it. Uh, avoid horseplay. Uh, try not to use annoying language, um, inappropriate slangs. Um, for example, some of us who may have been accustomed to citizen band radio or CB radio language from usage, you know, there are some words that are used. So, for example, I'll, I'll say them. Uh, we have heard radio operators, Rajo, they, it's a sort of colloquialism on Roger, but it really sounds inappropriate, um, you know, so we should try to avoid using those types of slangs on the radio as we, as we are trained and we become uh, proficient and uh, practice uh, radio operators. Also avoid spreading false information. Uh, it's very easy to inadvertently spread it, so always check your sources and make sure that you're authentic in whatever information you pass. Be mindful of inadvertently sharing confidential or sensitive information. You may want to use another channel. In an emergency, there are ways to pass uh, information. So for example, a person who has died, you may want to say, you know, code black. That is a, an example of where it might be appropriate to use a code. But generally, um, we speak plain language and try to avoid confidential and sensitive information. Of course, on the radio, try to avoid monopolizing a channel that is shared amongst multiple operators. It might be okay in some instances, but there may be others waiting to use it. So radio operators who do MCOMs, or emergency communications, we want to make sure that our equipment can withstand the power outage or loss of electricity supply. And that often means using some sort of backup power. Often that would be batteries. It could be batteries that are connected to alternative sources of energy, such as solar, wind, using some sort of charge controller to keep your battery topped up. Uh, you may also have some form of a generator and so on. But the point is for emergency communications, we need to be resilient to cater for an event of loss of supply. So that's a very practical, um, if you are gearing, and most of us, many of us, should really be gearing for that. It can't be that power goes and we are out of communications. Of course, it requires an investment. We also should have a go kit, and we're talking about radio equipment here, that if it is we need to leave our base station, our base station is compromised, or we are required to be deployed, maybe a served agency needs us to be at another location, maybe we have a pre-planned location for us to be deployed to, maybe an EOC, maybe a shelter. Um, and of course, again, coming back to the React context, we may work very closely with, let's say, the Red Cross, for instance, and we may go, uh, there may be a shelter manager, uh, there may be Red Cross, and they require communication at that location, and we need to take equipment with us so we have a go kit with everything ready, including spares. Uh, it's important that we become familiar with that go kit equipment because it may be different to our standard equipment. And if you have packed up your radio equipment for three months, six months, a year, and haven't used it when you deploy, it may not be obvious um, which is the channel selector, which is the high and low power button, and which is, you know. So you need to become familiar. We all do need to practice. And that's why we say drills and exercises are important. That helps us practice during non-emergency times. So even nets, the simple things like radio nets. So persons who are already familiar with radio networks thinking, well, you know, a net is something that we do. But that is also gearing us all to be ready, you know, to use our radio to make sure that we are practiced, to know how other persons sound and know where we are reaching. So networks are one of the ways 
We don't usually consider them drills or exercises, but that certainly helps with the activity and familiarity. It goes a long way in helping us know what to do in an emergency. So of course, before that emergency occurs, we expected to undertake drills and exercises. It helps us understand our equipment, the features, it func the functions. It helps us understand the various procedures of not only our organization and our agency and uh, those of us who are members of organizations that will have procedures, but also as we interface and interact with other organizations, what their procedures are, what are the protocols? And as we know now under COVID-19, we have some new protocols to uh, be mindful of, so very important. And that's where drills and exercises, it could be tabletop type exercises that we go through the paces and we uh, become familiar with what those are, our stakeholders and what services they provide. So we need to engage with regular drills and exercises. Uh, just a couple other points in terms of emergency communications. We spoke about the go-kit already. One that is often forgotten is lighting of some sort. So we get, we are deployed and it might be that we are deployed in the daytime and then the nighttime comes and where we are deployed to has no power. So we power an equipment, huh? we are operational, we are good to go. But guess what? We need to write something down on a piece of paper, for instance, and we don't have light. We're trying to depend on maybe a little light on the radio or we try to use our cell phone, perhaps. But bear in mind, lighting in your go kit could be an important aspect. You may be deployed at nighttime. You need to have writing material. Don't depend necessarily on your cell phone or your tablet. You want to have pen, pencil, paper to be able to write. Uh, spare batteries, spare fuses, that's another aspect that often is forgotten. A fuse can uh, blow, as we say, uh, in an emergency. And if you don't have spare fuses, you are down just because you don't have a fuse. Of course, because we would be logging information, and we'll come to a slide on message handling in a little bit, you want to make sure if you are using a watch or yourself, whatever it is, you want to make sure that that time is synchronized so that when we are logging and say at 10.05 p.m. or 10.05 a.m., it's, ex, ex, it's actually 10.05 a.m. or 10.05 p.m. It shouldn't be 10.15 and so on. So when you log something, you are doing it with some level of accuracy. Also, when you're deployed to an emergency situation, make sure that you look after certain things. So yes, we are very interested in serving uh, as emergency communicators, as volunteers, as reactors, as amateur radio operators or budding ones, whatever, whatever areas radio operators uh, we endeavor to, we need to make sure that our home and our family is safe. We really, yes, we are caring and concerned for those that we wish to help. The served agencies are depending on us. We need to go out there and help deploy, pass that message, get information on relief, where, 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 where assistance is required, injuries, uh, getting things like relief supplies and uh, mattresses and food stuff. Yes, we know we have to do all of that, but we need to make sure that our family, our home is safe before we can go out there. We need to ensure if uh, we're employed or workplace or whatever f form of um, employment is, maybe working for that it's secure. We need to make sure we have food, water, medication for ourselves. Make sure, especially with COVID-19, we have our sanitation um, and take into account COVID-19 protocols as well. So it's not just the regular sanitation. Important documents that you may want to have with you. Um, and it's not that you have evacuated your home, but you need, you, there may be some important documents that you need to have with you. Uh, you may want to have contact information. Um, as a REACT member, for instance, you may need to make sure that you have your REACT ID card that has your certifications in the back and so on, because some agencies, uh, I know some of the persons in the US, uh, for instance, before you go into an EOC, they want to see your credentials. Are you Sky One? Are you MCOMs? Are you ICS 100, 200, 700, 800 uh, certified and so on? And you may need to work with your credentials to be able, otherwise they may put you in another area of the room uh, to do some other function other than emergency communications. Of course, clothing, proper wear, uh, make sure that we use proper footwear, proper uh, personal protective equipment. Do we need to go in a jumper? Make sure that we have our proper wear and clothing uh, so that we are safe and we are comfortable. So we did mention message handling as an important aspect. 
we always have to make sure that we pay attention to official sources. Sometimes we are deployed in an emergency situation and information is coming to us, but we also have to make sure that that information is credible. So we, I recommend uh, using official sources of information, for example, weather information. Yes, we may have intelligence of unofficial agencies, good to know, but always pay attention to the official sources because sometimes the unofficial sources may not be accurate. They may be quick, they may be fast, they may be fancy, they may look good, sound good, but it may not be accurate. So you want to be careful of avoiding unofficial information. Maybe you could use it as intelligence, but still see so. Avoid passing on unverified information. If information might be suitable, it might be intelligence, but it's not confirmed, see so. Use the term unconfirmed. Say, you know what? Um, I have heard so and so on, but it's not confirmed. We'll treat it as just intelligence for now, that we are mindful that this may occur, but it's unconfirmed. Uh, that may be helpful to pass on confirmed information, but emphasize that it is not confirmed because you don't want somebody thinking that it is true uh, when it's not. You could let them know that you heard it, it's not verified, you didn't see it yourself. Someone has said it, but it's unconfirmed. It's worth looking into to verify so that they go about verifying the veracity of it. Is it accurate? The source of information, um, again, speaking in the rare context, uh, must be credible and verifiable. That is one of the tenets of React operations. Indicate if you are the person on scene and you have seen what has happened. You are, you are visually, you, are, you, are, you have seen um, flooding taking place. You are seeing a river that's overtopping, for instance. Or is it from a third party, somebody called you and told you? And how credible is it? Or is it a WhatsApp information that got forwarded a thousand times and you don't know if it's from this month, last month, last year, or from a different country? So if you are passing that information, if you must, um, indicate it's unverified, indicate it's a, it's a third party, but try to verify it first before. You should be that bastion to try and confirm. Use read back as well. So if someone is on the radio that is passing that information to you, Read back the information and make sure that you got it clearly so that you may not, so you would not have misunderstood what the person said. So that's one way of ensuring reliable information is passed. Use a message form when you are recording or a log, especially if you're doing formal or emergency traffic. Make sure you write it down because you will forget and somebody may want, an agency may require a log, for instance, and it may form part of a legal uh, documents. So you need to log. That's where the date and time we said synchronize your watches, your clocks. So you lock the date and time accurately and the information, the message. And speaking of the message, we have message handling forms. Uh, if you have nothing in front of you, a plain sheet of paper will work for a message, you know, but we do have forms. So React International Radiogram, the ICS general message form called ICS 213. And this webinar, we don't have enough time to go through everything. We have an example of what the ICS213 form is there. But for training, detailed training, React International offers several courses. And we have listed there two courses that are available on the radiogram and the ICS213 general messaging. So for training, please check those out on the React website. We come to the use of call signs. As radio operators, each of us will have a call sign. Now, it depends on the radio service. So if we are an amateur radio operator, we will have a call sign that's issued by an authority. If we are a member of an organization like React, React will issue us with a call sign. But whatever service, utilize a call sign when you're communicating. The use of call signs will often be governed by some rules or some regulations. It could be a framework, it could be a license, it could be a policy depending on the radio service. Again, in the React context, React members that utilize, let's say, a VHF radio system are expected to use their React call sign when identifying. So remember that React forms part of the call sign. So let's say, uh, let's say my call sign were to be React 100, 100. I should say React 100, not 100 or 100. It's React 100. That's the entire call sign. Yes, it might be expedient to truncate it, but your call sign as a reactor, as a react number is react100. Okay. Uh, some additional tips. Of course, while, you know, we encourage persons to be cordial and friendly when we are transmitting, 
occasional greetings are allowed is acceptable you know for example christmas time and new years and certain other um, auspicious uh, occasions it may be appropriate but always operators must use good judgment as to what constitute a suitable conversation and on, on the frequency not every and every conversation that you will have in person uh, let's say in the market will be suitable for uh, radio operations. We need sometimes we think so, but quite fun, quite frankly, and quite often it's not. We need to have a measure of consideration. Now it's a challenge really to list every do and don't on the radio. It really is a challenge. So we have general guidelines like what we are presented throughout the course of our discussion in our webinar. Um, however, as previously indicated. Uh, on any of these radio systems, whether it's amateur radio or React commercial license frequencies, political, religious, and contentious discussions are considered inappropriate. Don't argue on the frequency. Don't have a, a contentious issue. If you're disagreeing, if you have a disagreement with someone, say, "Here's what I'll call you," and pick up the phone and call. And if you must, you know, uh, have a contentious discussion, fine. Probably when it's safe to meet people, you know, but not on the radio frequency, please. That's very important. Okay, so a couple other related uh, tips. So, for example, coming back to the React context and the VHF radio system uh, in use in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, those frequencies are licensed by the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, TAT, and requires proper operations at all times. In other words, you can't just do what you want on the frequency, right? We can't. Uh, many government agencies also actively monitor react frequencies, several, several agencies. So therefore, we must be professional at all times. That doesn't mean that we cannot have a nice exchange of greeting uh, and keep the frequency active, but we must keep the pitch professional at all times. All transmissions must be suitable and it must be a good reflection of the React organization. Be polite. The frequency is not the best medium to have a difficult conversation or disagreements or arguments or confrontation. If any transmissions start to go in that direction, move it to some other more appropriate means, a phone call, for instance. Uh, any improper operation will have the potential to bring the React organization into dispute. So please avoid it. The organization has worked very hard over many years. Many persons, long before those of us who are in it now, have set a certain standard and we need to try to strive towards it. We are human beings. Uh, we have feelings. And sometimes, you know, we may want to say certain things, uh, you know, we are in disagreement with. But please, we are asking, especially the persons who are React members in Trinidad and Tobago, this is an important part. The new recruits, new persons coming on board, uh, we are trying to expose you to what the standard is expected of, and we're seeing it here. Of course, we need to give priority to emergencies, and we spoke about pauses and transmissions. We said if we don't pause during our transmissions, an emergency may go unattended, so that is also very important, and that's why we need to make sure our transmissions are not too long-winded. Again, we said avoid using codes by using plain language. Some audio tips. So we spoke about noise and so on before, but let's rehash a couple points about audio. We need to develop an awareness of the sensitivity of our microphones, as each can be quite different. If some persons may be fortunate to have a desk mic at their base, a, a fist mic or a handheld mic. Some persons may be using um, a radio, a handheld radio, or may have an external microphone. We need to know how that works and the way to do it is to become aware of the sensitivity by when you're having a conversation you ask a person how am i sound am i loud and clear am i soft and you will know how to use that microphone based on the feedback locate where on the microphone the element is and it's often a little tiny hole and there's usually the word mic next to it that is where you need to speak into not at the top of the mic not at the bottom not at the side not at the back you really do need to speak into the microphone three to six inches, right? Fist type microphones usually have a spot where it's located. And of course, when you speak at a suitable distance away, if you speak any uh, distance further than you need to, you can have low audio and background noise may be present in your transmission. If you're any closer, uh, you might have snap crackles and pops in your audio because you're over modulating, you're driving your audio too loud. 
Again, be mindful of those background noises. You'll be surprised how loud those noises come through the microphone. Even your voice may be low in comparison to those background noises. Try to operate with a background noise, background that is quiet if possible. Be respectful of the persons that are listening to you. The same advice is given also when using our telephones and speakers and so on. Try to be respectful of your recipient or your, the person receiving your transmissions. Uh, microphones can be sensitive to what we are considering low volume. So we are in our living room and there's a television with a news broadcast. We think it's low, but you'll be surprised how loud it sounds on the other side. All right, so some very specific operation tips. Let's say when we're going to call another radio operator. So I wish to speak to another radio operator. Make sure, first of all, that the radio is on the correct channel. Now that may be obvious, but check it because it's possible if you have multiple channels. So for instance, as reactors, uh, we are, for example, authorized to use the, one of the ODPM frequencies. You need to make sure that you're in the react frequency when you're making a react call. You don't want to switch inadvertently to the ODPM frequency and make a react call. That uh, you know, could be embarrassing, but it will be certainly not considered very professional. So check the frequency, check the channel. And amateur radio operators, the same thing. Make sure you're on the correct repeater. Make sure you're using the correct frequency before you make your call. Uh, make sure your radio is at the appropriate volume. You, if your volume is off and you make a call, you may not hear the response. Also, if your volume is too loud, uh, you may get a jolt when the person responds to you. So make sure you have adequate volume. Learn your radio, as we have been saying all along. Make sure you have the volume set to the correct level. Listen to the channel. Well, we say for at least 10 seconds, um, maybe 30 seconds might be better. Listen, just make sure there's no existing traffic on the frequency or on the channel before you make that call. You don't want to just switch on your radio or switch to the channel and then make a call right away. You may be disturbing a transmission in progress or worse, there may be an emergency in progress and you hamper that emergency. So you press the push to talk button. Again, this is where an in-person session would have come in uh, to be a little more useful to us, but you press the push to talk on your radio. But when you press that push to talk, don't start talking as soon as you press that push to talk. Give it about a second before you start to talk. And the reason is you don't want to truncate the first couple syllables of your voice. That is what will happen if you start to talk as you press the push to talk. So press the push to talk, make sure it's in, and in your mind you can count maybe about a second, and then you start to speak. That will improve your transmission significantly. You may need to be mindful of it and uh, talk through yourself doing that one second before you talk until it becomes second nature. Now you need to say the call sign. If you're making a call to another radio operator, you need to say the call sign of the other radio operator first, then state your own call sign. An untrained radio operator tends to do the opposite. They, stand, they tend to say their call sign to the other radio operator. So once you're using the word to, uh, that's how you know that you are not in the right sequence. From would be a better uh, word to use. So if you're using to. So when you're calling that radio operator, make sure you are using your call sign first and the other person call sign after. When you have finished making your call, do not immediately release the push to talk button. Wait at least one second after your last syllable before you release the push to talk. Because if you don't, you may not be aware of it, you might actually release the push to talk before your last syllable. So you're truncating on the front and you're trunca trun truncating on the back. And therefore, a person may say, could you say again, I didn't hear everything that you said and you have just wasted time. So practice avoiding truncation of your transmission at the start and avoiding truncation at the end by just giving it one second when you press the push to talk before speaking and before you finish, uh, when you have finished your speech or you're your talking, you release the push to talk about one second afterwards. And avoid using two. So usually on trained operators, you'll hear them saying two. So avoid using it because it reverses the correct order. So let's give an example of what we have just said. So let's say my React call sign is React 104. Now again, 
Uh, if you're using another radio service, such as the amateur radio service, marine service, whatever service that you're using, you can adjust to the pro appropriate call sign. But I'm just using a React example. So let's say I'm React 104, and I wish to call my good friend React 601. This is an example of how I'll make the call. I will press, of course, do all the steps that I mentioned before, tune to the correct channel, listen, make sure there's no transmission in progress. When I push or press the push to talk, wait about one second and I will go like this. React 601, React 104. And after about a second, I release. That is one example of how I'll make that call in the radio. Notice I did not say React 1042, React 601. Yeah, I said React 601, React 104. An alternate way, if you need to, is to use the word from. You can say React 601 from React 104, if that will help you maintain the order. Because once you go with two, your order is incorrect. If you use from, it will be kind of hard to say the incorrect order. Yet another tip. You can also say, if you're not comf comfortable using the word from, you can say this is. So, for example, React 601, this is React 104. So all of the three examples that we have listed on your screen here that I've just verbalized are considered proper operating practice and sounds professional. So this is what we advocate for as our best practice in radio operations. And we ask persons to review this and try. It may take some time, especially if we are custom, if I'm accustomed using the reverse order, it may take some time to wean off of it. But practice, practice, practice. So again, the call sign of the called party first and the call sign of the calling party afterwards. So the other person's call sign first and then your call sign after. That order raises the bar in terms of your professional radio operation, how you sound. So just a couple of quick, wo uh, quick pro words to be used. So remember earlier on, I did mention there are some uh, slang, radio slang, Raju, okay, don't want to say it again. Uh, you know, that really doesn't sound appropriate, quite frankly. But there are some pro words that are encouraged to be used, a couple of them, over, so instead of that slang word that we mentioned earlier, you can say over. It just simply means that your current transmission is complete and you're handing over to the other person. So at the end of your transmission, when it's time for the other person to talk, you give them, it's like punctuating your, your speech. It's like a full stop over and the other person then starts to talk. So for instance, um, I am presently at the corner of Park and Frederick Street over and then the other person says, okay, uh, React 104, I copied that you said you were in the corner of Park and Frederick Street. Is that correct? Over. And then I will come back to the person and said, yes, React 601, your uh, readback is correct. Over. Right. So there's no need in every single transmission to give your call signs, but interspersing is fine um, just so that, you know, uh, you're identifying the person periodically, but there's no need to always give call signs in every single transmission, but you, you do need to identify periodically during transmission. Another one is out. Uh, so I'm finished. I could say out to you or out to a station. And what that out means is that I'm complete with my transmission to them. So that's another pro word. Again, we're not going to be exhaustive with these pro words, but just some alternatives to some of the slangs that may be used. And then standing by is another one. That means that you are monitoring. Sometimes you may hear persons come up saying that they are standing clear. Uh, standing clear is a very valuable term, but it's really applicable more to the HSSC health safety field or the construction sector when someone is standing clear. But in radio, we would say that we are standing by. That means that we are listening or that we are monitoring. So just a couple of pro words. Now, the other slide that I'll show, uh, we will not be going through in detail, and it's really just for net operations. Um, nets or radio networks occur, and they are gatherings of radio operators on a channel for a purpose. So it can be to exchange information, it could be to handle an emergency, it uh, could be a scheduled net, it could be an ad hoc net, uh, it could be a directed net, 
Uh, it could be a tech. There are different types of nets or networks. Um, depends on the purpose. But the point of this slide is that React International has a course number 105 that is good training for net operations. So anyone that is interested in getting some training on net operations, please check out the course for React International 105. Um, a net control station is, of course, like a chairperson. And if it's a directed net, all traffic must go through that chairperson. You cannot or should not speak until that chairperson or net control station has given you the go ahead. So when we are checking into a net, it's important that we give our call sign. Now the React practice in Trinidad and Tobago is to give your call sign only. We know there are other nets, amateur radio nets and other practices elsewhere. They will ask you for your call sign, name and location when you're checking in. But our React practice in Trinidad and Tobago is simply to state your call sign. So if a net control on the radio says, do we have any check-ins at this time? All I do, for instance, is key my push to talk and say React 104. And release, that's all I need to say. All I need to say is my call sign. I don't need to say, good evening, net control. This is React 104, presently located in Chagua, and checking in. No, that's a little bit too long. Why? Because in emergency nets, where speed the, of, of emergency traffic is important, you don't want to be ineffective and inefficient. What we practice in normal times is what we do in an emergency quite often, because that's what we are practiced. So therefore, we want to prepare ourselves for emergency operations at all times. So checking internet, we just need to give our call signs only. Again, adjust accordingly for your local situation if your net procedure, uh, net script provides for alternative. But in Trinidad and Tobago, checking into a React net, just your call sign. When the net controller acknowledges you, and tells you to go ahead with the rest of your traffic, then you can provide additional information, whatever they ask for, maybe your name, your location, um, information on the weather, whatever. It is. But checking internet, we are asking persons, just call sign only. Of course, in a net, you want to avoid interrupting the flow unless you have an emergency. So if a net controller is taking a check-in from another operator and information and you turn on your radio and you hear that traffic going on and the net controller is having an exchange with that person, try to avoid interrupting unless it's an emergency. And if it is an emergency, give your call sign with the word emergency and the net controller will halt all other traffic and give you priority. So we also advocate for React members to consider volunteering yourselves as net control. It helps you, it helps develop your communication skills. It also contributes to the organization and eases the burden of existing net controllers. And we do have a course, React International course 116 is on net control operations. So check that course out as well if you're interested in having further training on net, uh, net control operations. So right now the React website is undergoing some maintenance. However, the, the URL at the top, reactintl.org slash training is where you can access the training courses that's offered by React International. React also encourages some of the FEMA, NIMS, ICS, Incident Command System courses and other courses that's available via the um, FEMA website, self-study, and there is the link on the screen. We also encourage persons to consider taking amateur radio training, becoming amateur uh, radio operators, getting your license in whatever jurisdiction that you are. And we also do have training available for the amateur radio technician class. That's the FCC exam, but it's also applicable to several other countries outside of the US, including Trinidad and Tobago and some other of the Caribbean territories. And we have an on-demand technician class at that web link on the screen. There are 16 sessions. We are currently doing the general class. However, the sessions that are already completed are available also on demand at the playlist using the second link. So the technician class as well as the general class. Quite a lot more training that we have time in this webinar to go through and concepts that could help us as radio operators understand the technology and help us optimize 
our radio operations. So our session here has really just been to have some introductory information, some practical tips, a little bit of uh, theory, but also what are some of the things that we can do to improve our radio operations, to sound better uh, from a professionalism level and also to sound better in terms of our access to our radio repeaters and having loud and clear transmission. So those were some of the tips that we provided. Uh, next steps, you can send any questions that you have to that email address on your screen, robbie at 9z4rg.com, or you can send a WhatsApp. You can send it to that WhatsApp uh, number on the screen or persons who have my personal number, you can feel free to send it that as well. Uh, we can have follow-up sessions. Uh, we can have interactive demonstrations if and when time permitted. We know we have a few teams in Trinidad and Tobago, one team in particular that is interested in such sessions and we will seek to facilitate. So today's session was really just a webinar to discuss some of uh, those key elements and we can develop further when we are able to do in-person session. You know, it's kind of like uh, teaching someone to ride a bicycle over a webinar. Uh, exceedingly difficult. Um, I don't know if it's impossible. I don't think there's anything that's impossible. But really and truly, uh, certain things you really have to get into practice and practical sessions. Right now, uh, due to the pandemic, it's not safe to do so, but when permitted, we can. Uh, take the opportunity to invite persons. Uh, we do have persons on the webinar that I'm sure that are not currently licensed amateurs or REACT members and would like to interact and do some radio operations. Well, Zello is a free walkie-talkie app and you can download it. And REACT does operate a couple of channels on Zello and you are uh, invited, you're welcome to join if you have not already done so. And we do follow these practices that we mentioned earlier on the Zello channel. So it simulates walkie-talkie type operation or, or push-to-talk walkie-talkie -talk, walkie operations. And it can simulate effectively as if you had a radio system. Just bear in mind, Zello utilizes the internet and needs, needs either um, some sort of data plan or Wi-Fi to be able to work. But feel free to check it out. Thank you very much to everyone, a very good attendance. I must say thanks so much for the interest and we really do appreciate your participation in this evening's webinar. Feel free, I'll just leave up this slide with the email address and the WhatsApp number for a couple of seconds again. Uh, feel free to send any questions that you do have and we can follow up uh, with any responses. So everyone, uh, be safe. Take good care. Um, those persons who are in the amateur radio uh, class, we do have our regular scheduled Friday sessions coming up. Looking forward to seeing you there. And everyone uh, do take good care. Uh, all the best. Um, be safe, most importantly. And looking forward to keeping in Thanks again, everyone. Okay, Anthony, nice to have you in the session tonight. Uh, you're welcome. Good night. Okay, June. Thanks so much. Uh, Victor, Marlene, you're certainly welcome. Adish, all the best, man. Thanks a lot. Okay, Charlene, noted. Um, thanks a lot. Iskin, all the best. All right, take good care. Okay, um, AV, you're certainly welcome. All the best. Okay, Ramzan. Wonderful, glad, glad, uh, glad they found it interesting. Okay, Boyo, um, blessings as well, take good care. Carol, glad you, glad, glad you made it. You're welcome, take care. All right, Ronald, thanks a lot. Really appreciate the uh, kind feedback and the encouragement. <laughs> All right, Sylvester, have a good night. Gary, thanks a lot for the feedback. Okay, Dennis, much appreciated your feedback. Appreciate the, um, the encouragement. Thanks, Albert. Really appreciate it. Okay, Elizabeth, you're welcome. All the best, take good care. Hope all is well in point. Okay, Carlton, you're certainly welcome. Have a good night. Carol, okay, glad, glad you found it interesting. Take good care. Okay, Pablo, appreciate the comments. Wesley, you too, have a good night. All the best, man, thanks. 
Thanks, Ron. Uh, nice to have you inside here. Uh, I trust that uh, the internet was steady tonight. Take good care. Not sure if you're in Canada or if you're in the US, but have a good one. All the best. All right. Okay. Thanks for joining at work there, uh, Carolyn. Glad you were able to be part of it. Okay. Thanks, Kenneth. All the best. Cool, Larry. Glad, glad you were able to make it, man. All right. Okay, Junior, take good care. Appreciate the comments. Okay, um, Neil, I saw your question here, so I'll get back to you. Lisa, thank you so much for the encouragement. Really appreciate it. Glad you were able to join in. Okay, Boland, good night to you as well. Take good care. God, thanks a lot, man. Appreciate the encouragement. Yeah. Glad you were able to uh, be part of it. Okay, Gloria. Noted. Glad you, glad you found it interesting. Certainly a pleasure. All right, Larry, take good care. Okay, Pablo. Neil, you're welcome. Take good care. Okay, thumbs up there, Hayden. <laughs> thanks so much. Appreciate it. Okay, Kenrick, thanks for the feedback as well. Do have a good night. You're welcome, Monique. Glad you were able to join. Okay, George. Oh, glad you made it, man. Wonderful. You too. Have a good night. You're welcome. Okay, Tito. Thanks so much for the kind feedback. Appreciate it. I'll give you a buzz. All the best to the home circle. 